to start with one of our old colleagues. And we'll this video. We are going to start with Professor Shrinivas Chakravarti. And just to tell you a little bit about Shrinivas Chakravarti. So he's a professor in the Department of Biotechnology. He's actually an electrical engineer. So that tells you, that actually tells you how interdisciplinary this whole thing is. So he is an electrical engineer who worked in neurosciences and he has worked in the, com and his lab is what is called mm -hmm. the computational neuroscience lab, where he develops models of neural oscillations, basal ganglia, stroke rehabilitation and neurovascular coupling. And uh, he wears many hats. He has written two books on neuroscience and he's also the inventor of a novel script called Bharti, which is a unified script for Indian languages. So he's going to speak to us on computing on something which is something which is very well studied by him for a long time. So he's going to talk about computing with rhythms and the search for deep oscillatory neural networks. She knew us. Uh, thank you, Nilma. Let me share my slides. Can you all see the slides? Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> So the, thanks a lot, uh, Nilma, and uh, grateful to uh, my colleagues uh, for giving me this opportunity. Also, I'm a bit nervous uh, to be the opening batsman uh, for this uh, workshop uh, because I'm going to <clears throat> describe a class of models which may not be strictly, you know, uh, describable as reservoir computing. Maybe if you take a broader view of things, maybe you can describe them also as reservoirs because these are reservoirs of uh, oscillators, not only oscillators. <clears throat> So my topic today is uh, computing with rhythms. That is a search for oscillatory deep neural networks. Uh, so I'll talk about a bunch of oscillating neural networks, uh, which which can uh, pave the foundation, pave the way to a broad class of models of brain dynamics. So we all know that neurons communicate with each other by exchanging electrical signals, right? And uh, so if you record from a single neuron, focus single neuron, the micro electrode and record from it. It activity looks uh, like something like what you see on the right side. <clears throat> so I give a pass a DC current into the neuron and in response, the neuron might produce these sharp voltage fluctuations and call the action potentials. And that's the signal using which neurons communicate with, with, with each other. So if that is how the signal looks like, you know, how would you mathematically describe that signal? So what is the neural code? So this is a very hot problem. So there are two schools of thought regarding this. One is called the spike code, which says that the information in the output of a neuron is basically in the time at which the spike is generated. So the spike, the action potential or the spike is, is basically has an idealized uh, shape. So there's not much information in the shape and size of that action potential. So the only information it contains is the time at which it has occurred. So, so you can describe ideally a series of spikes as a, a train of delta functions. So that, that is what is called the spike code. So that's an idealization. There's another school of thought which says that you don't even need to worry about the actual spike times. Just take the average frequency of the spikes over some kind of integrating window. <clears throat> and then uh, look at the frequency variation and uh, or the rate, right? the rate variation. And that's called the rate code. So based on the spike code and the, and the rate code, you have uh, neuron models which embody these two approaches to neural coding, right? And uh, usually spiking neurons uh, are used when you model a real brain, more realistic brain dynamics. And in artificial domains, like you know, in AI and deep learning, you use more rate-coded neurons. So if you look at rate-coded neurons, the kinds of neuron models we use in AI and deep learning. So in, the thing is in deep learning, there is a wide variety of architectures but when it comes to the neural elements, there, is, there doesn't have uh, too much of variety because uh, the oldest one is the, the famous sigmoidal neuron where the nonlinear function is, you know, like is a sigmoid function. Then more recently in the deep learning uh, era, people are using ReLU and leaky ReLU and all these, neuro all these neuron models. Uh, these are static neuron models. So if you want dynamics, uh, one famous workhorse of dynamics in you know, deep learning is LSTM long short-term memory. There's also uh, 
uh, uh, gated, uh, I think, uh, realistic neurons. So there are several, we have also proposed a neuron model called the flip-flop neuron, inspired by the flip-flops of electrical engineering. So they all have similar properties. They gate the input and uh, you know decide when to allow certain information to pass or when to block it in the trainable. So this is like the kind of bag of tools that you have uh, or the neuron models that you use in deep learning. Uh, <clears throat> so the thing is the, the objective of deep learning is to reproduce human intelligence in its outer manifestations. I mean, the uh, deep learning doesn't really care about the machinery of intelligence, which is the brain. I mean, how does brain work? That's not of interest in deep learning. We just want to capture the input of behavior. And in that respect, it's been quite successful in several domains, like, you know, for example, simple sensory processing, uh, visual, auditory. In these areas, uh, deep learning networks have really excelled and are able to match human performance because these are areas where we thought that uh, humans are always better, right? but that's not true anymore, at least when it comes to certain, you know, certain data sets. So, uh, so, deep, so, so new networks have started, you know, you can say in the 80s, right, with the, with the development of, or in the 60s, if you go back to Perceptron. And uh, in the 2006, with the famous paper by Hinton and colleagues, there was kind of a rediscovery of, right, uh, of uh, new network, some kind of renaissance of new networks has taken place. Only thing is people have given it a new label and Carl said this, all this whole thing is AI and kind of appropriated that whole technology because there was a, multi-decade long standoff between AI and, and neural networks. Uh, it was not clear who is the winner because at different decades, you know, different uh, paradigms seem to be winning. So finally in 2000s, uh, people said, look, uh, this is pretty hot. So let us just appropriate it and call the whole thing AI in a broad band. Mm -hmm. So a deep neural network is nothing but a, a neural network with lots of hidden layers. So like, you know, if you have more than one hidden layer, you call it a deep network. Okay, so that is the uh, AI uh, artificial networks and the trajectory of more artificial networks. If you look at spiking neuron models, there are uh, again a wide variety of spiking neuron models, but these are more biologically more realistic or considered to be more realistic. The simplest is the leaky integrated and fire neuron, which is which has a single variable, single differential equation, and something that's uh, so that is given by this circuit. I'm not going into you know, details of all this, but I'll come to the uh, real topic very soon. Then you have Vizikevich neuron model, which is a, a two variable system and the uh, non is only quadratic. So which is uh, it's a very elegant model. Only thing is there is hidden non in terms of uh, some complex uh, resetting uh, step. That is if the first variable voltage, if it causes a threshold value, then you reset it to some lower constant value. And the second variable is updated you know, by incrementally right, by adding certain value D. So it's a very simple model, but very powerful. You can say it's a, some kind of universal neuron model. By just varying the parameters, you can reproduce a wide variety of neural firing patterns. <clears throat> then we have the famous Hodgson-Huxley model, which was uh, probably the first computational neuron model and proposed in the 60s. And this this uh, got, the invent, got the inventors Hodgson-Huxley a Nobel Prize. So this was inspired by the squid axon. Uh, this model has four variables and it's highly nonlinear, right? So, so you start with something very simple and first order like the leaky integrated fire neuron model. Then we have second order models. And then you have you know, fourth order or you know, four variable models. <coughs> you can take this trend up further and further. And where you have uh, like, you know, for a single neuron, you can have a few hundred equations because you can divide a single the neuron can be quite complex in its geometry and its morphology. So you can divide the neuron into lots of small pieces and write a different equation for each piece. And I can have like a neuron model with finite equations. That's quite, you know, quite, quite uh, normal. So here you get to more biophysically, biophysical neuron models. So you see two extremes, right? On one side, you have the super simple neuron model, which takes just takes a bunch of inputs, adds them up, Right and passes through a nonlinear function like a sigmoid function, and which is what is used in artificial domains. On the other ex extreme, you have this biophysical, very detailed neuron model, uh, where for a single neuron you might use a few hundred differential equations. Right, but so the problem is, if you look at the artificial end, that uh, the the objective is not to understand how brain works. 
right? If you look at this more detailed biological extreme, I mean, the objective is how to understand how brain works, but if you're, the basic element is going to be so complicated, it's very hard to, right, understand uh, the brain at larger scales, at systems levels and all that. So obviously there's a billion dollar question, which is what is that sweet spot? What is that golden middle ground? Where if you operate, right, you can get uh, beautiful theories of brain function. I mean, so nobody knows what that sweet spot is. But obviously the question is being asked again and again, because we don't know where to stop, you know, where to uh, pitch our tents and you know, develop our models. Mm -hmm. The question of right level arises uh, often, right, whenever you do modeling of any system, uh, take for example, fluid mechanics. And in engineering, we face this all the time. Only thing is we know how to make abstractions. So if you're studying planetary motion, you assume that the planets are point masses which is an atrocious assumption if we look at it like a biologist. But for a physicist, it's a very natural assumption. It's, it's pretty good. And you get very accurate orbits, right? Similarly, in engineering, if you look at uh, study of an aircraft wing, we want to study the flow of you know, air, uh, wind around the aircraft wing. We don't try to simulate molecular uh, dynamics collisions of the molecules of the air on the aircraft wing. That will take forever if you start doing that. We invoke this abstraction called fluid, and fluid is not molecules. But at the same time, it's not something vague. It's very rigorously definable mathematically. And you write Neue Stokes equation, and you, you design your wing pretty effectively. If that is the case, then what about if you take this analogy to neurons? Maybe by modeling single neuron at great detail, or maybe even to even to, by modeling at single neuron level, are we making brain theories too complicated? Right, maybe we should not model at single neuron level, but model at you know groups of neurons or masses of neurons, like are you know, ensembles of neurons. So the thing is, uh, how does the signal of an ensemble of neuron look? So for that, again, there are there is a provision for measuring the collective activity of a bunch of neurons. So instead of poking a single neuron with a microelectrode, you can have slightly more blunt electrode and uh, measure the and just shove it inside a neighborhood of neurons. And, uh, and and measure the output of all those neurons. And uh, this output, again, you low pass filter it, you kill all these very sharp spikes, and you get a smooth signal, as you can see on the right uh, end of the slide. <clears throat> so this smooth signal is called the local field potential, and meaning is quite obvious. And the high pass filter uh, applied output, which has all these spikes. That from this uh, signal, you can actually extract the spikes, and that's a very hot problem. Right? But uh, if you look at the smoother signal, local, you know, local field potential, that's a much more convenient uh, signal to work with. Because spikes, I mean, let's face it, they're the they're pain in the neck. And because the whole math becomes more complicated, neuron models become more complicated. Networks are even harder to analyze, right? And, uh, and learning algorithms are also quite challenging to design. So you have, and people have been overcoming all these challenges, but I mean, face, let's face it, it's, uh, it's slightly painful. Whereas if you look at local field potential and, uh, and, and try to, you know, if you take that as a signal, then you can use all these uh, you know, tools of signal processing, right filters and bands and modulation, demodulation, multiplexing. In principle, you can use all these tools and you, get a, you can kind of uh, uh, unmask, borrow all the tools of system theory from electrical engineering and recreate brain theory on those lines. And that look very simple, just as simple as uh, the framework that you use in analytic engineering. Because there is a way, there is a level at which you can look at brain dynamics without going to single neuron level. And which is what we talk of when we talk of uh, brain waves, for example. So when we measure the brain's activity by a surface electrode put placed on the skull, uh, you have these signals and you can divide the signal into many bands. And you know, each band is given some significant name and function and so on. So from 0.2 to 3 hertz, it is called delta wave. 3 to 8 hertz, it's called theta wave. And each of them has lots of functions. They're found in different parts of the brain doing different things. And you know, beta, gamma, and so on. So entire brain dynamics, right? at least the frequencies of significance, range anywhere between 0 0.01 hertz to maybe 500 hertz. So everything happens in that band. And this band is nothing compared to your electromagnetic spectra, because I mean, if you look at radio waves or you know, any of these waves, it's the band is much bigger. 
But I mean, this is the fact of brain dynamics, and this all in this narrow band. Mm -hmm. Now <clears throat> we are talking about this sweet spot. Where to where to pitch all our you know, theoretical efforts? So there is this paper by Bazaki and Dragoon, who is a you know very big name in neurobiology, and he talks in terms of you know LFPs and this you know waves and frequencies and all that. And he says that in this paper, science paper, he says. Synchronous activity of oscillating networks is now viewed as the critical middle ground linking single neuron activity to behavior. So single neuron activity has spikes, but if you look at synchronous activity of bunches of neurons, right, that uh, you need to be able to describe brain dynamics in terms of such synchronous activity, and that seems to be the middle ground. And so, so how do you model a bunch of so so that points leads us to a third. And a third front, if you want to use a political term, a third option that is, uh, you have the red coded neuron and you have the spike neuron and two extremes. Now, the third option is not a single neuron model, but a model of a whole ensemble of neurons. That the net activity of them, how do you model them? So the the activity of an ensemble of neuron is like a smoother signal. So you know you can reduce it to a bunch of oscillations. So why not use oscillators, nonlinear oscillators, right, to model such uh, activity? Now the interesting thing is there are many nonlinear oscillator models readily available in computational systems already. You don't have to you know, make up some new models. Like here are a couple of examples: wilson kavan model or Fujinaga model, which is reduced version of uh, Hodgson-Huxley model. Morris Lecker, Van der Poel model is a very old model used extensively in engineering, and lots of players in biology, you know, people use it. Uh, in a lot of areas. Mm -hmm. The thing is the same, the oscillator models, these neural oscillator models have been used kind of in, in dual purpose mode. Because sometimes uh, the oscillation, you pretend that the oscillation waveform represents an action potential. And sometimes you pretend that the oscillation waveform represents the activity of a neural ensemble or what's called a mass model. But in, so people have been using it in both senses. Okay, we'll use in this talk, we use it in the second sense that it represents the activity of a mass model. So now the, these neural oscillators are limit cycle oscillators compared to a simple harmonic oscillator, which you might have studied in your you know, plus two physics or plus two mathematics. <coughs> so a limit cycle is basically as a closed trajectory that, you know, that if you start from, if you perturb it off the trajectory and start it from some neighborhood, the system will come back to that trajectory, like especially if it is a, a stable limit set. So this is different from a harmonic oscillator, which you might have said in your high school, which is that it's a periodic solution, but if you knock off the, the given trajectory, then it will continue from this new position on a new orbit. It doesn't come back to the old orbit. So there is, you're not talking about a stable orbit, right? a single orbit on which the system uh, rotates. Whereas in case of a limit cycle, there's a single orbit, an isolated orbit, to which the system returns on perturbation. So we have taken one particular oscillator, nonlinear oscillator model called the Hopf oscillator, which we realize has some very interesting mathematical properties, which will lend us to you know easily to construct uh, large scale networks and you know develop training algorithms and all that. So Hopf oscillator equations are given like this. It's a it has two variables x and y, and uh, the nonlinearity on the right side is uh, cubic. And uh, the thing is, in the, in the Cartesian form, it looks slightly complicated, but if you convert it to polar form, it looks very simple. So basically, you have r dot is equal to mu r into 1 minus r squared. That's for the r, r dynamics. Theta, theta dot is simply constant, So which, and, uh, which means it's a simple rotor. It goes round and round at some constant angular velocity. Now, if you look at the r equation, the differential equation governing r, if r is less than 1, the right side is positive, so R has to increase. If R is greater than one, the right side becomes negative, so R has to decrease. So basically R tends to one always. Theta simply goes round and round. So basically, as you can see in the graph, in, in the right bottom, this system goes round and round the unit cycle at a constant angular velocity. It's a very simple rotor. <clears throat> now you can also express these two equations uh, in, in, in complex variable form by combining x and y into a complex number, right? z is equal to x plus i. And you can show that uh, this is the form dz by dt is equal to i omega z. 
So this GZ by dt is equal to I omega z. This part is linear and that is a simple harmonic oscillator of frequency omega. You can easily verify that. And when you add this nonlinear term, one minus mod z square times z, that's when you get the half oscillator. And you can easily work the math and show that it's the same oscillator that we have seen two slides ago. So the <clears throat> bigger agenda that we have is to literally rework the entire neural network theory, right? Using uh, this hop oscillator as a basic element, basic neural element, right? So we have hop field networks in neural networks. So construct oscillatory hop field networks. <coughs> or oscillatory auto encoders, oscillatory deep neural networks, oscillatory self management. So we have succeeded in uh, realizing the first three, but when it comes to deep networks, we have made some progress, we have some solutions, but it's not complete. We still have some problems designing a like, you know, uh, deep network of arbitrary number of you know, hidden layers. So we're still making some you know, progress in that. Mm -hmm. So if you take a hop oscillator, right? like any oscillator, you would expect that you'll have some kind of a resonance property. <coughs> That is, if you give it an oscillatory input, a sinus order input, the response amplitude of the oscillator should be highest when the frequency of the input oscillator should be is equal to the frequency of the oscillator. Mm -hmm. And you see that happening here. So <clears throat> the x-axis is actually the frequency difference. It's not the actual absolute frequency. You can difference between the oscillator and the input. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, <clears throat> as you vary this difference, uh, both on the positive side and negative side. Up to a point, there's a clean bell curve, which shows that there is a resonance. But beyond that, uh, this, this, uh, the oscillator fails to follow the input uh, input sensor, right? And uh, there's a huge ripples and all that. So the clean uh, resonance property is lost uh, beyond the window. But within that window, it has nice resonance property. Okay, <clears throat> now how do you couple a pair of hop oscillators? Right, so that's the nature of a single half oscillator. Now, how do you, if you want to construct networks, you have to start coupling them, right, and construct uh, smaller and smaller and progressively larger networks. If I couple two half oscillators, and let us assume that the coupling constant is positive, is real, right, because the, the oscillator itself is, is described by complex variables, but let us assume that the coupling constant is real. <laughs> And real, and let's say in the first case on the left side, it is positive and symmetric. The coupling constant in both directions is positive, uh, 0.5. When you do that, you see that the oscillations simply synchronize and phase difference becomes zero, which is kind of expected because two oscillators coupled with a positive constant, right? They, they synchronize. Next, let us consider uh, the same system with a negative coupling, right? Then because they're trying to push away each other, the oscillations go away from, move away from each other. And then you develop a phase difference, they go out of phase, you have phase difference of pi or 180 degrees. So they both are very simple and easy to understand. <clears throat> but the thing is, uh, thing is in, a, in a large network, I want to have more general behavior. Because if I have a pair of oscillators, if, I, if the only phase difference I can get is zero or pi, that's very restrictive. How can I get arbitrary phase difference? So looks, and that can be found, that can be achieved if you use a complex coupling. So take the same system, instead of using a real valued coupling, <coughs> take a complex coupling, where from one to two, your coupling constant is A into E power I phi, and two to one, it is A into, uh, sorry, first one is A into E power minus I phi. The reverse is A power A into E power I phi. So basically the two, Coupling constants are in a com complex conjugates. So when you do that, you can do some simple algebra <coughs> and show that the phase difference that you get is just nothing but equal to the angle of the coupling constant. Mm -hmm. So phi is equal to psi, okay, which is so which will let you by playing with this uh, phase angle, right, of the coupling constant, you can get arbitrary phase differences. Now this result was known before we didn't invent this, uh, but this was a good step towards what I, what I'll be talking about. 
Now let us step, go one step further and take two oscillators which have slightly different frequencies. So the thing is, if the frequencies are different, I mean, which is what is desirable, you know, it's, that it will be a more general network. If frequency difference is only slight, right? Then again, life is simple. If I use a coupling constant, which is sufficiently large, I can force the two oscillators to come to a common frequency. And at that common frequency, we can show that the faster oscillator leads the slower oscillator by some fixed phase. So you can see that in this uh, simulation, mm -hmm. the two oscillators have frequencies two and 2.2, .2, so they're not the same, but close to each other. Now I start with a coupling constant epsilon of zero. So when you do that, when at zero, obviously there's no coupling, so they are at totally different frequencies. Mm -hmm. Then you keep on increasing epsilon <clears throat> at some point, you see that uh, the two frequencies have come to a common frequency. And uh, after that, they, they fire in, in, in the fire with a fixed phase difference. But the thing is, that's also not very satisfying because I want a network in which oscillators have arbitrary different frequencies, not just you know, uh, some frequency close to, to some average value. Mm -hmm. So the thing is, when you have, take a pair of oscillators, so where the frequencies are arbitrary, then uh, the, the dynamics between two oscillators becomes quite complicated, as can be depicted by the by this map called Arnold terms. So let, let us look at take a look at this map. On the x-axis, you have the ratio of the two frequencies. This is the these are the intrinsic frequencies of the oscillators. So when you have, when you couple them, they enter in and they can come to some common frequency and all that. But we're not talking about that. These are the original frequencies of the oscillator, that is omega 1 by omega. On the y-axis, we are showing the coupling constant. So earlier we have seen that uh, when the frequency is slightly diff different, by using a sufficiently strong coupling constant, you can bring them to one frequency. That is called synchronization. That's what is shown in this yellow band here. So the ratio is not one, but close to one. Then I'll just have to increase the coupling constant to a certain value and cross a threshold, kind of enter this yellow band, right? Uh, then the two oscillators come to a common frequency that is, and have one to one ratio of, the, of frequency. Mm -hmm. Similarly, if you have uh, two oscillators which are, whose ratio is close to two is to one, right? It's a 2.1. So then you have to again increase the coupling strength sufficiently so that they'll come to two is to one. So point is, if the two frequencies are, are, are not, don't form a simple, are irrational in their, in their ratio, then by increasing the coupling constant, you can bring them, make them entrain uh, to some kind of a simple integral ratio. But thing is, until they reach that point, there is no stable phase relationship. The phases keep drifting. So point is, if, I, if, you, if you aspire to construct in large networks in which the phase are deterministic, I can train the network to produce some reliable behavior and all that. And even if the, at the level of a pair of oscillators, things are so indisciplined, sort of, right? Then it becomes difficult to design larger networks. So now what do we mean by a stable phase? So what do you mean by discipline? What do you mean by stable phase? Difference? Because when the two oscillators have different frequencies, you cannot have a phase difference, right? Uh, but what you can have is something called a normalized phase difference. That is, I can have, Theta one, first phase by omega one, minus, minus theta two by omega two. This number, we can hope to be, make it constant, right? Uh, so how do you do that? Even that is not clear how to do it. How do you do that? So we propose something called a power coupling, where this power coupling is nothing to <clears throat> right, you know, do with you know, power and, and all that. <laughs> the whole idea is like this. Suppose I have three oscillators, all three at different frequencies. When oscillator one is talks to oscillator two, so it's sending out a signal over a connection. At the connection, the frequency of the oscillator one, which is omega one, is transformed into the frequency of oscillator two, which is omega two. So the oscillator two listens to only uh, omega two frequency signal coming from oscillator one. Although the original signal from oscillator one is at omega one. Similarly, the signal coming from oscillator three to oscillator two is also transformed to omega two from omega three at the connection. So how do you do that? It's very simple. It's, it's not, there's no magic to this. So suppose the oscillator output 
of you know, output of oscillator one z1 is of the form a1 times e to the i omega one t. How do you change this to frequency omega two? It's very simple. It's just common sense, right? Raises to the power omega two by omega one, right? And then the frequency shifts to omega two. So something like in electrical engineering, you have transformers which step up and step down the voltage. So like similarly here, we are trying to step up and step down the frequency. This is what is called modulation in electrical engineering or say communication theory. This is some kind of a modulation. Mm -hmm. So at the connection, so if you have a pair of oscillators at the connection, you transform omega one to omega two. And, and similarly in the reverse direction at the connection from two to one, you transform the signal Z2 from omega two to omega. So each oscillator is only listening to its own frequencies. So there's no problems of entrainment and all that. And, the, and uh, because at the connection, all the transformation is taking place. It's like, you know, you have this real time translation apps that are coming on you know, your smartphones. So you could be talking in French, other guy could be talking in Hindi. And uh, you know you can talk without any problem because the app is converting your speech into real time. This is something like that. So again, uh, if you use this kind of coupling and also you need to have a special kind of coupling factor. So simple algebra again. If you do this, you can show very easily that the normalized phase difference is equal to, can be made to be equal to any desired Constant. So, okay, so th that you can see in this numerical simulation. And uh, not only that, it is uh, in addition to that one solution, it also has a few other solutions, but it's a fairly large basin of attractor. So, if you start anywhere in that basin, you will hit that solution. <clears throat> okay, so now the mathematically, it might be interesting, it might have some interesting properties and all that, but Biologically, how do you justify something like this? What is this power coupling? Called? So the thing is, if you think about it, what happens at the connection between two neurons all the time seems to be something like what we are seeing in power coupling. Because in power coupling, basically we are seeing that there's a frequency shift, right? Now, if you take two neurons, I have the left neuron and the presynaptic neuron and the postsynaptic neuron here. The presynaptic neuron, let us say, produces high frequency action potentials, as you can see in the top. And the post synaptic neuron produces always low frequency action potentials. And at the synapse, uh, so you can you, basically all that you need to convert this high frequency input to a low frequency output is basically to play with the threshold of activation of the post synaptic neuron and the integration time constant, the RC, the membrane time constant. So if you do that, I can make this transformation. So, so now instead of Coupling to single neurons, imagine you're coupling to neural ensembles, to neural networks. We are in the first network, I have a bunch of excitatory inhibitory neurons all coupled, just like in a small patch of cortex. And similarly, on the second side, also you have a bunch of E and I neurons coupled. And uh, if I look at the average activity of the, all the neurons in each network, that will look like a smooth signal. And, and uh, so that, so the first one will be high frequency signal, second is low frequency signal. And that's what is transformed. The frequency is transformed over the connection. So, so the thing is, all the power coupling seems slightly, you know, artificial from mathemat you know, mathematically speaking. But from a biological point of view, also you can give it a plausible interpretation, biologically plausible interpretation. Mm -hmm. Next, so if you have a single oscillator like this, uh, how do you train this? How do you train it? Uh, train the frequency of the oscillator so that right it can track the frequency of some input stimulus, which is sinus order. So these equations uh, give you that. This actually, we just use these equations from Rigetti et al. and kind of generalize that to complex domain so that you know, even the input is a complex uh, you know, signal, complex sinus order signal, it is silver. So you see that happening here. The, the input signal is uh, sine 30t and the frequency of the oscillator is 40. And you give the input signal to the oscillator and keep on adjusting its frequency, right? So the frequency gradually drops from 40 to 30 and at 30, it kind of stabilizes. So the oscillator is trying to track the input frequency. It's kind of like how you track the radio signal by turning the knob, right? This is something like <clears throat> So we have seen how to couple a pair of oscillators in such a way that the normalized phase difference is equal to any desired value. We have seen how to train a single oscillator so that the oscillator can follow your input sinusoidal signal and then tune itself to that input frequency. 
Now, how can you construct a network of such oscillators so the network can learn any arbitrary time series? So let us do see how to do that. <coughs> so this is a block diagram of the network. These are the equations. And uh, so you see that network has a layer of oscillators. This is like the reservoir of oscillators. And all the oscillators are coupled internally. We have n square connections, the complex valid connections. And then from the outputs of the oscillators, you have a pre-powered connections, which is a linear stage, uh, which are all combined in one output node. And uh, where you have the predict predicted output of the network. And this signal, S of P, is supposed to be equal to a teaching signal called the P-teach, right? And then uh, you train the network so that these two signals uh, become close to each other, get close to each other. So let's look at a numerical simulation. I have p teach which has uh, just these three sense order components. And uh, I have a network which has, I think, 100 oscillators. So initially I take, uh, I, I, since I don't know what are the frequencies in the input signal, I'm not supposed to know. So I just randomly initialize all the frequencies of the network oscillators. And in, in the first stage of training, you train only the frequency of the network. Mm -hmm. So when you do that, you see that on the right side, you at the top, you see the initial distribution of frequencies of the oscillators. And after training, after the first test training, all the oscillator frequencies become clustered around those frequencies present in the input signal. The network has learned the input frequency components. That's what you see from here. Then after that, you can train this network to, so you just have to train the lateral connections among the oscillators. And there's a this way of doing it. It's a very simple algorithm. And then there is also, you need to train the forward connection, which is a simple delta rule, right? So you do that and you can train the network to produce some time series. So on the right bottom, you see that there are two output neurons in this case. In for output one, it, the fit is so good that you cannot even see the difference between the actual output and the predicted. In the output two, there is a little deviation, but I'll show you quickly that even this can be fixed and you can, learn very complicated signals uh, pretty accurately using this class of networks. Well, let, just give me a minute. Mm -hmm. So so we have, next, this work is done by Deepa and this was my PhD student and, and also this other guy, Surya Kiran. So we have taken a bunch of EEG signals, electroencephalogram signals to see if this network can learn that. The ultimate motive behind this is we want to develop this network as a model of brain dynamics, a large scale model of brain dynamics. So that if you have like a whole brain EEG signals from some fine coil electrodes, <clears throat> a network of maybe like a thousand oscillators, uh, I would like to train this network to be able to produce all these finer channels of you know, EEG data. That's, that's what the ultimate goal is. <laughs> so in this preliminary study, uh, these guys have just taken six channels and uh, train train network on that. And it has about 100 or 200 oscillators. It learns it in a pretty accurate, as you can see in these plots. And also just like in any neural network, as you increase the number of oscillators, right, your error goes down. As the network gets bigger and bigger, the error goes down, goes smaller, becomes smaller and smaller. <coughs> so now uh, a very good uh, project of a similar nature, which is being conducted in uh, University of Marseille in France, is the Virtual Brain Project, or TVB. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> so in this project, they take uh, networks of neural oscillators, like for example, Pujun or Bumo, or you know, uh, Wilson Kovan, and this kind of oscillator models, even hop oscillators, and couple them, and then train this network to produce various kinds of brain dynamics as it is measured using, for example, EEG or fMRI or MEG. Now, the thing is, this class of models is very good at learning brain dynamics, but you cannot train that network to learn some input output behavior. So take, for example, a deep network, like the convolution neural network. You can train this network to read images, to read digits and recognize digits and that, do, do that kind of thing. But uh, the convolutional network cannot capture brain dynamics. So that, that's their problem. Similarly, if you look at the oscillatory models like what is used in TVB, 
they are good at learning brain dynamics, but they cannot learn input output dynamics. They cannot learn how to classify digits or something. So that is their problem. So there's a dichotomy, right? Is it possible to create a unified modeling framework which can do both? So that will be more satisfying from an intellectual point of view. And also that kind of a model will be closer to uh, you know, a real brain model, right? So, so that is also our goal. And we have made some progress in that direction. So we were able to train our networks to, you know, to uh, model EEG data and fMRI data pretty accurately and show you some results. So this work is done by Sain Ghosh, a PhD student in my lab. So we have got data from uh, Dr. Sujit Vijayan, right, of Virginia Tech. This is uh, EEG data from 62 channels. I think 56 channels are EEG and this is EMG and other kinds of outputs. Mm -hmm. So these are the leads of the electrodes. <clears throat> so, so we train this network uh, on all these channels simultaneously. The one development we have made, improvement we have made from the previous network I've shown you is to add a bunch of hidden neurons between the oscillatory input neurons and, right, and the output neurons, which are just, uh, just combined outputs. So this introduction of the hidden layers made it really very powerful. And the network fits are uh, you know, quite accurate. Uh, so you see that this is uh, from a whole bunch of channels. You see that the uh, orange is uh, predicted and blue is uh, actual, something like that. So they were, both are almost coinciding, so it's hard to see any difference. I'm only showing a small number of samples, but this kind of result we obtained for all the 55 channels or so. Okay, and, uh, and this was. So we, we got each data from multiple states of sleep from waking, first of all, waking. And in sleep, you have NREM1, NREM2, REM, and so on. For all these different kinds of signals, the network is able to learn very accurately. So similar results were also obtained uh, by, you know, in, in, by applying the network to model fMRI data, that is the functional matter resonance, resonance imaging. So this work is done by Anirban, uh, along with Cyan, and we are collaborating with Professor Bhakti Raju of Triplite Hyderabad. Here, again, the basic idea is very similar. You have the same network of oscillators, but uh, you use fMRI signals to train this, okay? And, uh, and again, fMRI signals, you know, they, they represent the hemodynamics, that is blood flow dynamics, blood volume changes in the brain. This is a very slow oscillation, right? But so the, so the network will learn that and learn the slow, low frequencies of the dynamics, and it's able to capture dynamics very accurately. So I'll skip some of this stuff. Okay. Mm -hmm. So here again, as you increase the number of hidden neurons in this network, you get uh, better and better in approximation. Your root mean square error keeps going down. And the correlation coefficient, so basically what you do is, uh, you, you have this uh, functional connectivity matrix, right? something that represents the correlations among all the signals of various areas in the brain, right? And that matrix you take from predict network prediction and the actual experimental data, and then compare the two, two matrices and look at their correlation. And that correlation keeps increasing to close to one, okay? So it's, it's very accurate. So the next model that we tried is, like I was saying, it's interesting, it will be interesting to model the self-organizing self map which is not an, not an oscillatory model. It's a well-known model in neural networks. So it's able to successfully explain many different brain maps found often in the sensory uh, particle areas in the brain. So the idea of, uh, similarly, we want to present a map model for, for what is called a tonotopic map. That's a map of sounds. So how does it work? Uh, so there are, uh, so best example of a tonotopic map is what you have in your inner ear. So, so ear is like, you know, ear process sounds and encodes them into some kind of electrical signals and then sends the signals to the brain. So how does, how does it happen? So you know the eardrum, right, which receives the airwaves and vibrates in response to that. The, to this eardrum on the other side, you have three bones which are connected. These are called malleus, incus, and stapes. You must have read about them in your you know, high school biology or something. And then the stapes chap, the last chap, uh, actually is connected to a membrane called the basilar membrane, 
right, which is all coiled into a spiral, like in a snail, right? You see the spiraling structure in a snail. So it's all coiled in a spiral inside what you know as cochlea. So now this tapes is like a, think of it as a doorknob, which keeps banging on the tip of that membrane, right? And or tugging at it repeatedly. <clears throat> Depending upon the frequency of this tugging, a specific part of this membrane vibrates. So for example, your frequency of tugging is 100 Hertz. The far end of the, vibra of the membrane vibrates. Or if the frequency is one kilohertz, a thousand hertz, somewhere in the middle, this membrane vibrates. So basically, it is this membrane is so beautifully computing some kind of a Fourier transform of the input signal. And in this membrane, you have different cells. It's a special class of cells called cilia, which have uh, structures called cilia. And uh, so they also this cilia wave in response to these vibrations, and that waving motion. Uh, it's converted to electrical signals, and that's what is sent to the brain. So, so this is like a tonotopic map, but uh, it's not a neural map. It's a physical map that arises due to the dynamics, the physical dynamics of the of the membrane. But a more interesting neural map, a tonotopic map, is what is found in the auditory cortex, uh, particularly of bats, because bats are very interesting from auditory function point of view. Because unlike other mammals, uh, which uh, which you depend a lot on vision for for navigation, bats depend a lot on sounds for navigation. Not only that, they they emit these sounds, right? And then when the sounds bounce off targets and uh, come back to the bats, the bats ears, the auditory system processes it and guides the animal towards the target. So it's, it's like a radar basically, right? And even the sounds and ultrasound in a, a range. So if you look at the artery cortex of the bats, the, if you take the primary artery cortex, which is where the, which is like the first stage of processing of artery signals uh, in the artery cortex of bats. So you see that orange uh, strip, which almost looks like a wristwatch, right? Uh, so you see the, uh, see the numbers on this uh, orange strip. In the rightmost end, you see that this is the number 10. That means the neurons here respond to frequencies of about 10 kilohertz. And the other extreme, you have neurons respond to frequencies of about 100 kilohertz. In the center, you have uh, neurons responding to frequency on one side and also phase on the other side. Okay, so, so this is called the DSCF area. That there's some biological exp no, expansion for that. And that these areas are higher order cortical areas. So, so which do even more sophisticated artery processing. So this is the, this is a donotopic map. So we tried to implement this. Uh, again, this work was done by Deepan. So he took an array of pop oscillators. The idea is to train this in such a way that in one axis, you have frequency represented. In the other axis, you have phase represented. So in this case, a small change made to the previous network model. In this case, I have an array of oscillators, and then there is a small single oscillator called the reference oscillator, right, which projects to all the oscillators, which connects all these oscillators. And uh, so that is used to define the phase differences. Because if you want to encode the phase difference among n oscillators, uh, in the previous method, we use n square connection, which is wasteful, right, is n is enough. So that's what, that's the kind of improvement we made in this, uh, in this current case. Even the learning rule is slightly modified. We have something called modified path coupling. I'll skip all these equations. So now you have these new, these oscillator models, which show some kind of a tuning property, not only to the frequency, that is when the frequency of a given oscillator matches that of the input signal, then it shows a sharp increase in amplitude. Otherwise it has lower amplitude. So there's a kind of bell curve. A similar bell curve is also seen in response to phase. Right, and then we had to struggle, go to great lengths to produce both these effects simultaneously. So now if I give some signal to this map, so in the first case, I've given a single sinusoid and this is a map response. So entire column of oscillators respond because that entire column represents one frequency. And within that column, you see that in the center, there's a small P. So those new, those oscillators represent a certain phase and, and the phase of those oscillators uh, is equal to the phase of the input signal. Okay, so the map is tuned to both phase and frequency. 
And similarly, if you give more complicated signals with multiple frequency components, you find different parts of the map getting activated in response to that. <clears throat> then we also worked on hardware implementations of these oscillators. There's something called a you know, VO2 uh, memory store. <laughs> this is an all linear device and which when, coupled, when coupled with the conductance and the capacitance like this, will produce spontaneous oscillations. So this work is done by Akhil and Dipan. And uh, so what we have shown is that the, if you, if you draw the null clients, the, make the phase plot of this system, right? Uh, and just turn it around by 90 degrees. The phase plot is very similar to a well-known neuron model called the Morris Ricard model. Actually, it's not a neuron model, it's a muscle model, but it's a, it's a very similar model to a neuron model. And both are very similar. And with this kind of a analogy, we said it will be fun to construct small networks and, put, and, and uh, simulate locomotion, generate locomotion rhythms. Because locomotion in, in the animal world is quite rich and quite interesting to study. Because four legged animals, quadrupeds, produce a very interesting variety of uh, locomotive rhythms. Like, for example, walking, trotting, pace, gallop. Each rhythm is characterized by not only a certain speed, but also certain phase relationships among the four legs. So uh, we have taken four oscillators, these VO2 oscillators, and coupled them with uh, four capacitors like this. And what Akhil and Deepan have shown is that by varying these capacitor values, right, and you can produce all these rhythms, right, in a walk, uh, trot, pace, canter, gallop, and so on. And so this was submitted to ITP transaction unit works and still waiting for final final uh, decision. So our ultimate goal is to construct deep oscillator neural networks where we have some results, but they're all, I would say, incomplete. So I'm not going to talk about that, still work in progress. Again, the final goal of our, my lab is to create some kind of an oscillatory brain theory or an oscillator-based theory of brain. And describe all, all the major phenomena in the brain in terms of oscillations and create, because I'm strongly influenced by my undergrad W background. Because in doubly, you have this, uh, you know, systems theory, you know, transfer function, and so signals and systems theory, which can be applied to a wide variety of domains. It's such a powerful and you know, framework. So why can't we kind of resurrect that, right, and find uh, find that happening in in the brain? So this is a long term goal, and also try to uh, create an embodiment of all these neural network models in a robotic. Uh, re realization, instantiation, and then show that these models actually work in a real world application. I just so, want to interrupt for one yeah, thank minute. You. Uh, no, oh, you yeah. are done. Okay. I'm done. So thank great, you. great job. We have 10 minutes for yeah. questions. So that's yeah. fine. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, you are done, right? This is the yeah, I'm done. So any questions? Yes. I have a question, Shinya. Yeah. See, most of the stuff that you did in the beginning, especially when you were looking at the oscillators and coupled oscillators, uh, you were working in a domain where the ratio of the frequencies was rational, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. What happens if you work in a domain where the ratio of the frequencies is irrational? Like, for example, you know that once you are outside the anal tongues, you see quasi periodicity. Mm. So the ratios are, in fact, irrational. Yeah. What difference does it make to the kind of things that you are doing? Have you tried that at all? No, actually, <clears throat> so my whole point is that is a problem with the older kind of coupling. Yeah. That you have to have rational ratios. Ah. But the power coupling doesn't have any such restriction. You can have any it's totally arbitrary frequencies. That's the whole idea of power coupling. You get rid of those shackles of all those restrictions because Arnold tongue map is uh, pretty scary, right? I mean, at every step you have entrainment or no entrainment. Right. Uh, it's a very dense map. Whereas right. there is no such restriction with the uh, power couple. You can have omega one, omega two are arbitrary. And the normalized phase difference is equal to your desired value, whatever you want. See, what your mode logging does is that it takes you from one frequency to another, right? Because you have put, put in the exact power, right? Yeah. So when you put the irrational coupling, you will actually be putting in some rational approximation, obviously, in 
especially if you are doing a simulation, some rational approximation to that irrational number. Yeah. Right. So, what do you expect in such a situation? I mean, that will be like a special case of what we are dealing with. There is. So the problem is okay. We are assuming a certain kind of coupling. Normally, the coupling, if you take, what is it called, diffusive coupling, right? Uh, yeah. Some yeah, epsilon yeah. times uh, x one minus x two kind of thing. Right. Then you have all these problems. But uh, if you have this weird power coupling, huh. you don't have to deal with any of that stuff. Okay. And that's what I want to actually check with you guys at some point. That is, uh, in, but in in implementing power coupling. we are raising a complex number to a real power right now in the process you end up with all the issues of uh, riemann surfaces ha huh. right and our matlab implementation gives you gives doesn't give any problems we are able to train the networks on very large data sets and all that beautiful yeah but in the back of my mind i still have a lurking fear that it will blow up on our face at some point because of how it will have lots of singularities and you know this problems of this determining which which surface are you on at any given time all these things i haven't dealt with that i think in this regime we are probably not near a singularity i, I mean, don't know so we are only depending guess. on numerical simulations and where things are totally fine yeah but theoretically we need to look at that at some point yeah, yeah. so are there any other questions any other questions yeah, i have one question yeah sir uh when you were uh, looking into coupling all these uh, uh, hidden layers the all mm. the neurons in all the oscillators in the hidden layers mm. you made you made a statement that uh, having all to all mm. coupling is not very efficient it is just too much yeah. so you ha huh, so do you did you have any uh, arrive at any uh, conclusion about what should be the how should the coupling be in the sense that uh See, essentially from a lattice you are probably taking a lattice model where uh, things are very regular but yeah. if they are very irregular and uh, rather complex <laughs> the network the, the topology becomes very complex and is there something that you can come up with saying that uh, the uh, average degree of uh, should be this or some something about the topology uh, which tells you whether there is some optimality is being reached great question i may not know the complete answer but let me just tell you like in the first network which is which i've shown which is the reservoir right it's a you have n oscillators and they're all coupled among them so you have n square connections and the purpose of the connections is to set the phase difference that is a normalized phase difference between any ith and jth oscillators so point is if i have n it's like you know n oscillators To to if I have, if I know the phase difference between uh, i and j and j and k, I have already determined the uh, i and k also. So I don't need actually n square parameters, right? Uh, n is enough. But the way that network is set up, we have we have used n square. So to get rid of that here, the other one which is a map, which is a two D grid, we have one oscillator and which connects to all these n square oscillators, and that link has a phase angle. as is the complex weight as a phase angle that is enough to find out the you know to determine the phase difference set the phase for all the oscillators but that should apply to even more general networks because as far as that connection is concerned the grid like structure of the map as as is, is not of any concern but uh, see the generally this whole problem of setting the phase by using not maybe not just one oscillator but a small set of oscillators Connecting to a large network of oscillators is of great interest because I we think that in the brain, the thalamus and cortex are related in a similar way. The so thalamus is a very central structure, a small structure. Cortex is a huge sheet covering the entire brain surface, and both these systems have feedback feedback connections. And uh, these oscillations of this thalamic cortical system provide the foundation for all brain dynamics. And that's the stage. on which all brain dynamics runs so this issue that you are talking should arise uh, we haven't really thought about that but i mean this is like hardcore complex systems problem uh, it would be nice to look at it more closely because it have a lot of repercussions to uh, to to develop a good brain dynamics model 
ఎస్పెషల్లీ తలమ కాటికల్ రిజమ్స్ Uh, we have time for one more question at least uh, yeah i have a question uh, i am mm-hmm. like i am right now working in ifes palma de mallorca spain so uh, like i have the data set for epileptic seizure like uh, from one group in czech in the czech, czech republic so can we build a mathematical model like the model like which you described like that can model like the onset of epileptic seizure in like mammals and other animals i think so absolutely we can do that because we wanted to do that uh, i talked to one guy in the university in the university of texas health science center in houston uh, okay. he said he'll give the data but i didn't have people to work on it but we can do it because the signals are very similar to it's easy right yeah so yeah if you're interested I, I, we can collaborate on that we can do that yeah yeah that would be great okay okay yeah. that's my question okay thank you <clears throat> uh, so if there are no further questions uh, i would like to request shrinivas to yeah. our next speaker is actually professor zevier he not yes yeah. inri wardo so he is someone known to you so yeah. i would like to request you to sure. introduce him yeah. and also to chair his session yeah yeah oh hi zevier uh, bojo how are you oh, <laughs> <laughs> how are you uh fine how are you so you all said uh let me so it's my 